There's a coffee shop in the town of Bluffton, South Carolina, that's known as the Corner Perk. It's near Charleston. Back in 2012, a woman who wished to remain anonymous handed the owner a $100 bill and said she wanted to pay for everyone's coffee until the money ran out. And the woman returned six or seven times, plunking down more money to pay for people's coffee and scones. People will come in and say, what do you mean? I don't understand. Are you trying to buy me a coffee today? Said the shop's owner, Josh Cook. And I say, no, somebody came in and left money to pay for drinks until it runs out. It didn't take long for the word about this to spread around Bluffton. Now, if you have a cynical view of human nature, you would think that upon hearing this, people would stampede into the corner perk in order to score some free coffee. But what's happened is that more and more customers began leaving money to pay for other people's drinks. What became, what started as an anonymous act of generosity became contagious. And 11 years after this first woman's act of generosity, people are still plunking down money and paying for other people's coffee. So if you're ever in Charleston, you could take a little side detour to Bluffton and stop by the Corner Perk. Maybe you'll get a free cup of coffee, or maybe you'll be, want to be generous and pay for somebody else's drink. And that goes to show that generosity is a wonderful thing. A random act of generosity can make somebody's day. And the giver gets a big rush out of it, too. There is nothing quite as delicious as giving a gift that helps someone, that delights someone. And best of all, generosity is contagious. Well, generosity is the subject of our reading from 2 Corinthians. And my aim today, following the lead of the passage, is to help you want to grow in generosity so that you discover the blessings and the deep joy that God intends for you. The Corinthian church, to whom Paul wrote, is mostly known for its problems. We read from Paul's second letter to the church. In the first letter, he lets them have it for their sexual immorality, for getting drunk at the Lord's Supper, for their spiritual snobbery towards their brothers and sisters who didn't have what they considered the bestest spiritual gift, speaking in tongues. But apparently by the time Paul wrote the second letter, the Corinthians had cleaned up their act. And in chapters 8 and 9, he turns to the subjects of generosity and sharing. In both chapters, Paul is writing about that offering that he is taking up for the church in Jerusalem. Why was it needed? Because the Jews in Jerusalem who put their faith in Jesus were suffering for their faith. They were likely excommunicated from their synagogues, had a hard time getting hired, had people stopped doing business with them. So Paul went to work, taking up a collection from the wealthy or churches in present-day Greece and Turkey to help out those impoverished Christians in Jerusalem. And in Acts 24, you can read of how Paul took this offering to the Jerusalem church. So Paul has two reasons for wanting to help the Corinthians. A practical reason to help their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who were suffering, and a spiritual reason that the, that the Corinthians discover the joys and blessings of generosity. Now, here's what he does first. He builds them up by telling them that he goes around boasting about their generosity. As they say in the South, bragging on them. He goes around bragging on them in order to encourage the other churches whom Paul is asking to contribute to the offering. Now, imagine if you did this with your children and grandchildren. You boast about them 
to other parents and other children, and it gets back to them. It's a great motivational tool, reinforcing and complimenting people for their strengths. Paul is genuinely complimenting the Corinthians for their past generosity. But he's also hoping that this boasting will motivate them to turn their piggy banks upside down and shake them a little harder so they can put together an outlandishly generous offering to relieve the suffering of their fellow Christians in Jerusalem. Second motivational strategy, Paul says in verses 6 and 7, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. The one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. It's a simple agricultural principle. The more seed you plant, the more you're going to harvest. But planting is also a risk. Back in those days, you didn't buy your seed from Monsanto. It was stored from the last harvest. It was your food reserve. And farmers took the risk of putting it in the ground and hoping the rain didn't wash the seed away, the crows didn't descend and eat it up, or that there's no rain so the seed never germinates. The thing is, you don't have a crop unless you sow the seed, but you take a risk in doing that because the seed wouldn't be there for you to eat it. The point Paul's making is that being generous works the same way. You won't experience the blessing that comes from generosity unless you take the risk of being generous, giving money and resources away. But when we do, we discover a fundamental truth about how God works, that God is generous to the generous. Like in Bluffton, generosity begets more generosity. It's in God's nature to be generous. A Mother Teresa story. Once when she was visiting a seminary in Bangalore, a nun said to her, Mother Teresa, you are spoiling the poor by giving them things free. They're losing their human dignity. Everyone got real quiet. And then Mother Teresa said calmly, no one spoils as much as God himself. See the wonderful gifts he has given freely. All of you have no glasses, yet you can see. If God were to demand money for your sight, what would happen? Continually we are breathing and living on oxygen we do not pay for. What would happen if God were to say, if you work four hours, you'll get sunshine and oxygen for two hours? How many of us would survive then? There are many congregations that spoil the rich. It is good to have one congregation in the name of the poor to spoil the poor. And nobody said a word after that. We serve a God who gives us the best of the best. Think back to the story of creation in Genesis. God didn't half-heartedly, sloppily create the universe and say, well, Good enough for government work. What did God say after God created? It was good, and then it is very good when it came to us. God gave us the best of his creative work. And that, then God gave us the supreme gift, his very self in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. God is immensely generous. And one form that God's generosity takes is blessing. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, it's not bad to receive, is it? Like earning money or getting a bequest in a will or receiving financial help during a tough time. Receiving can be wonderful. But the Lord is saying that it is even more of a blessing to give. And the Greek word means something like fortunate or to be in a good situation. Frederick Meekner says that back in Jesus' time, the word we translate blessing had kind of the sense that our word lucky has today. Not randomness, but surprise. Wow, I've been blessed. This is great. 
John Ortberg puts it like this. It's lucky to receive, blessed to receive, but you get more from giving. More freedom from self-obsessing. More freedom from worrying all the time. More meaning, more joy, more growth, and more fulfillment. You get more plain, old, stable, and enduring happiness when you're in giving mode. It's the best way to be. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, last few months, Susan and I have been working with a financial planner, and they don't say much of anything about giving. It's about saving and investing and watching expenses so you have enough to live on as you age. Giving means having less. Less to live on, less to have fun, less to have freedom to do what you want. But Jesus says the way to blessing is to give. Uh, how does this make sense? Well, Paul says that God is able to provide you every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may be able to share abundantly. He says that God will multiply your seed for sowing and your harvest of righteousness. The promise is that if we are generous, God makes it possible for us to be generous. And promises not that we're going to be rich, but that we will have enough. And the word also promises godliness with contentment is great gain. This is one of the marks of maturity as a follower of Christ. You learn generosity. You learn to trust God for your needs, and you find deep happiness, peace, and even joy in learning to be content, instead of constantly wanting, striving, and worrying. And Paul goes on to say that our giving builds long-term rewards, too. Maybe you've heard the saying that the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest. It works like this. If you invest $100 at 10% interest compounded daily, after 100 years, you will have $1.4 million. At the end of 200 years, $19 billion. And at the end of 500 years, an amount greater than the combined national product of the entire world. Only one catch. You've got to live 100 or 200 or 500 years to cash in. Now, money is a big way we keep score in this culture. We, we try to prove that we're a success. But God has a whole different scorekeeping system, what Paul is calling a harvest of righteousness that comes in part, part for how we use our wealth. Righteousness, how God puts us in right relationship with him through Jesus Christ so we can be in right relationship with other people. We are made righteous so we can do right by others. And as we do so, this, this harvest of righteousness grows. And if we are generous people, at the end of our lives, we're going to have a big honking harvest of righteousness. And this produces a life filled with joy and satisfaction and blessing. Final motivation to be a blessing to others. And this takes us back to why Paul is asking the Corinthians to give. Their sisters and brothers in Jerusalem were hurting. The gifts from the Corinthian and other churches would bless their sisters and brothers providing food, clothing, and shelter, getting them through a tough time, helping them endure and continue to be a church that helped others know Christ. You and I are invited to give so we can make a difference in the lives of our children and youth, the people we help in the missions we support, in building a church that helps others know Christ, and a church that we share with our community in teaching us how to be faithful disciples so we can be better parents and spouses, so we can make a positive difference in our workplaces and communities. 
And so we can do things like serve on mission trips and community organizations, then feed and clothe the poor. And also in your personal life, so you can be a source of goodness and help in what I call your walking around life as you encounter people to whom that $20 bill that's been sitting unused in your wallet for a month can make a big difference. As you learn of organizations that are helping people know Christ, helping lift people out of poverty, helping relieve suffering. What we get is a harvest of righteousness. Because one day you're going to be laying in a bed that you're never going to get out of. And in your last days and hours, you will look back on your life and wonder, did I make a difference? Was I a blessing to those around me? Was the world better for me having passed through? If you are generous with your time, with yourself, with your resources, there will be no doubt to the answer to those questions because your generosity will leave behind a harvest of righteousness. I close with a story about tithing, giving away 10% of your income from a very unlikely source, Forbes magazine. In the article, the writer tells about a guy named Greg Gianforte, the founder, chairman, and CEO of a company called Right Now Technology. He started this web services company in 1997 in the spare bedroom of his home. It was bought by Oracle in 2011 for $1.8 billion. Gianforte is a follower of Christ and says that tithing is a duty of his faith and that one must never tithe with expectations of divine reward. But strange thing is, he says, it brings all kinds of benefits quoting him. The decibel level in my life has gone down. I think that's because every possession speaks to you. Everything you own wants attention. When I began to tithe, I found a freedom from my possessions. I don't hold on so tightly to things anymore. When you loosen your grip, you become more willing to take a chance. Entrepreneurial risk is less terrifying. Tithing requires discipline, but it pays off because that discipline shows up unexpectedly in other areas of my life. For instance, I was able to get up earlier in the morning. I was more patient with other people. He concludes, when you tithe, you begin to see your role as a steward of resources. You don't engage in wasteful spending. You learn to become more creative. Jesus is right. The Bible is right. Generosity leads to blessing for others and for us too. Amen.